Hello and welcome to another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action, a series where leaders look back at decisions they've made and consider a series of questions. I'm Peter Stiepelman, I'm your host, and I'm an imperfect leader. I spent more than 20 years teaching and leading, first in the Oakland Public Schools in Oakland, California, and then in the Midwest, Missouri to be exact, where I was a teacher and a principal and assistant superintendent and then the superintendent of the fourth largest district in the state. I'm constantly striving to learn from my experiences and from the experiences of other leaders. The aim of this podcast is to lift the learning and lift the imperfect leaders up. That way, when you hear the term imperfect, you'll see strength. Strength from the candor needed to recognize imperfection as a real advantage. Let's get started. One of the things I love to do when working with leaders or teams of leaders is to use the power of language to help frame a situation. One way to do that is to use metaphors. My guest this week was once a band director, and so I asked him to use the metaphor of directing a band as a way to better understand the roles and responsibilities of a superintendent. If you're looking for a way to kick off a retreat with your team, big or small, consider putting images on the table, lots of different images, an orchestra, a circus, a line of people waiting for the bus, a a child holding balloons, a freshly baked pie. I I think you get it. Put them on the table, then ask your team members to choose one of those images that captures their current reality and one that captures an aspiration for their future reality. I promise you, it'll be one of the best sessions you ever have. You'll better understand your people, and the team will become more cohesive as it works to achieve its goals. My guest, Dr. Kenny Rodriguez, uses metaphor, and he transitions the conversation to the use of systems thinking and the importance of being able to engage in mid-course corrections. Kenny makes some of the most genuine reflections about the pandemic, too. Thanks for tuning in. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Dr. Kenny Rodriguez is my guest. Dr. Rodriguez has been the superintendent of the Grand UC 4 School District since 2016. Dr. Rodriguez has served in several capacities throughout his career. He created and implemented the first early college high school program in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was with a partnership through with uh, Tulsa Community College. And then in both Oklahoma and Missouri, he's done extensive work on the implementation of new teacher evaluation systems, really in an effort to raise academic achievement and also to build collaborative relationships between teachers and administrators. So Kenny, welcome to An Imperfect Leader. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it very much. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. So, Kenny, one of my great regrets, really, in the, in the almost 20 years that I was in Missouri, is that we really didn't get to know each other as well as I really had hoped. And for one thing, I hadn't realized, but you and I had a similar path in terms of going from the assistant superintendent in a system and then becoming the superintendent. And then I also noticed that you were a music educator. Now, I taught music in Oakland as in Oakland, California, as part of my teaching responsibilities, but there was, there, there wasn't, and, and mostly it was because there wasn't a, a music program in my elementary school. You were a real music educator. Eight years in two different states, including being a band director, percussion instructor, director, um, a music resource teacher. So um, I imagine that leading a district and leading a band are similar in, in a number of ways. And I wonder, how might we play with that metaphor just a bit? How did serving as a band director prepare you for the superintendency? I was actually approached by somebody when I was even considering not being a teacher anymore and wasn't sure what my next step was going to be. And somebody uh, who was an assistant superintendent at the time approached me um, who was, uh, I had worked with their husband and she approached me and she said, you know, Kenny, have you ever thought about going into administration? And I was like, no. Like, why in the world would I ever consider going to the dark side, you know, because that's always the dark side of things. And uh, so through a conversation, she said, I just want you to know that, you know, the abilities and the things that you guys do every day as band directors are exactly the things, the characteristics and the traits are exactly what I look for in my school leaders in terms of principles. She said, what do you mean? So, well, you've got to be able to um, talk to parents. You've got to be able to engage the community. You've got to be able to make sure that you are a visible person. But then you've got to take a lot of people from a lot of different ability levels, and you've got to be able to form them all into one team under one focus and one vision and one mission. And I uh, said, so you, you do all those things every day. Oh, and knowing that things are going to go wrong at any particular time, and you have to react very quickly in order to be able to fix those things on the fly. And, uh, and so, yeah, and you think about being on stage, and I remember being on stage and conducting a group, and it's like, oh, no. 
they're not where they're supposed to be. So what <laughs> am I going to do? How do I get everybody back on the same page and fix that so it's not a train wreck and we have to stop everything because you just don't have that ability a lot of times. So I always go back to that initial because I still feel like that's really true. Um, I still feel like I'm a music educator at heart. I still feel like I'm a teacher at heart. And I'm just teaching bigger versions of, of our kiddos and um, hopefully trickling down in that particular regard. But um, it's the same. It's a lot of the same basic premises, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. So many there's this common theme that seems to be going through in the conversation I've had with administrators is that um, if you see yourself as a teacher first, that uh, is one way to sustain this really difficult job. As a band director, I you know I thought similarly to what you just said that you've got lots of people playing different roles, important roles, but they also have to be in sync and they have to be playing the same piece. Your great trombonist and your incredible flautist, if they're playing two different pieces, it sounds like a cacophony of just chaos. So I imagine similar to a superintendent who has to think about facilities and maintenance, you know those instruments, are expensive and they're hard to maintain and they have to be, you know, have to be really vigilant about keeping things in, in order. And budgets. I mean, you were still doing budgets at that time. You were doing timelines of different things. You had to be extremely detailed. You had to create letters home. You had to make sure that you're thinking about schedules. You're thinking about what you're going to have instrumentation wise for the next school year. Um, because kids are going to graduate. And so what oh, do you sure. have next year? Yeah. And you've got to, I'm applying to be succession at, planning. Right. I, I'm looking at the next year. I've got to make sure that kids now are ready for, hey, we're applying to go to whatever parade and it, we have to do that over a year in advance. And so what am I going to have next year? I better make sure that I'm preparing for that right now by getting this, these group, hey, this is going to have a trumpet solo. So do I even have a soloist out there? Well, no, he's graduating. So how do I make sure? And a lot of connections for sure. Well, I'm going to I'm going to stick with the music theme here for a second, because I just finished reading this book absolutely on music. And mm -hmm. um, the author is Haruki Murakami, and he sits down with world renowned conductor Seiji Ozawa. And as I was reading, Seiji Ozawa mentions reading a score and then thinking he knows what the piece will sound like. And it really made me think about how we go into the superintendency having read, I don't know, like a strategic plan uh, for a district or, or the individual plans for individual schools. And we believe we know what needs to be done. And then as things are happening, we we might overlook or fail to see, as Seiji Ozawa remarks, how we fail to see the harmonies. So he said, oh, I didn't anticipate those harmonies and they don't sound the same way. And so for me, like in education, we fail to see the interaction of different systems. And so it forces us to go back to those plans, reread those and start again. And and that's what he did. And he went back to the scores and made course corrections. And so I thought about that in terms of leadership. And then one more, if, if you'll allow me, is I read uh, another quote, which was that Seiji Ozawa approached conducting in the 1960s differently from how he approached it in the 1970s. So it was observed that he was more reckless in the, in, in, in the 1960s and, and that just 10 years later, he appeared to be more mature. Uh, he said, well, when you become the music director, he had only been a conductor previously, you get very concerned about the quality of the orchestra. And it made me think about how we might be more spontaneous as teachers and principals and even assistant superintendents. And then when we become superintendents, we may become, I don't know if the word's more cautious, conservative, thoughtful, but we, we certainly begin to think even more clearly about three years from now, five years from now, where do we want to be? And uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, I, it's funny that you mentioned that last part in particular, because sometimes I think, at least I do, I look at it almost of, was I better? Was I better then? Because um, I literally was going through and deleting some notes and things um, that I had and was going back and looking at some notes uh, from when I was in Tulsa, but in particular, when I first got to Kansas City and I'm looking at all these questions that I was asking and all these things that I was doing. And I'm like, golly, do I, do I still have that same passion or do I still have that same push or am I more conservative now? And what, What's causing that and how am I still the same, but how am I different? And is it, is it just um, experience and intelligence uh, that I know better or is it some cautiousness too? And I don't have some of that same uh, push. So it's just interesting that you say that because I literally was looking at some of that and I wonder the same thing of, am I still pushing the same way or is it different? And is it different because it needs to be different and we've evolved 
Um, obviously, just even the last three years, the world's different today than it was last year and two years ago and three years ago, um, just in particular because of, uh, of the pandemic. But it's just interesting that you, you use that because I, I literally just had that thought um, recently of, is it, am I the same or am I a little bit different because of, of some of those uh, you know, components? But um, I, I agree with that assessment. In the leadership model that I've been using to advise others, there's a dimension called leaders learning work which really is like the mind or, or the brains of, of an organization's work. And inside that is a dimension, uh, there's a term that's uh, called uh, applying systems and design thinking. One system all superintendents think about is an accountability system. And I know that is something that you have a lot of familiarity with. And they, they want to answer the question, you know, how will I know if I'm being successful? And, and I saw that when you were in Oklahoma, you served as a lead examiner for the Oklahoma Quality Award Foundation based on the Baldridge process. And when I was selected superintendent, I visited a two-time Baldridge Award winner for guidance on setting measurable goals and then creating a scorecard that would allow me to kind of measure the success against district like ours. Uh, for those who are listening, um, I'll put a link to Baldridge in the episode notes. My question for you is more a philosophical one. When I first became superintendent, I put a lot of emphasis on the scorecard. And then as the years went on, I reevaluated what does success look like? And you have this deep experience with Baldridge, so I'm really curious to know your thoughts on this. What advice might you give others who are either starting out or are currently working on their strategic plans? Well, I think when we go back to just the conversation we just had about what's what's changed and what's different. And so I would think that as you went through similar to me, you know, experience and you learn what's going on and what, what needs to be different, what needs to change, you know, Baldridge was an amazing experience and going through that, but it's very detailed and very regimented, but it's just a series of questions. So I think it, it impacts me today because I think I still ask a lot of those same questions. I don't care how you get the results that you're going to get. You just have to know why you're getting them. I'm trying to reach here. Great. How are you going to get there? I'm going to do this. Okay. So what do you do when it doesn't work? And how do you know when you get there? I think the biggest thing that I always look at with strategic plans, um, since I've gone through all these in, in, in a couple different states and a few different districts, is the same mentality of a lot of times they just they get put on a shelf or they're created. And then, you know, we kind of look back on them and we don't do a very good job of, of reviewing them. But making sure that we're putting in um, abilities to make changes. Like, just think about this last strategic plan. So I instituted a strategic plan with a, an amazing group and, and team here in Grandview in 2019. Like that was year one. You can imagine how quickly that went off the rails in March when there was nothing in my strategic plan about, okay, so when you shut the whole district down and nobody has to come into work and you're trying to do things remotely, here's what our plan says to do about that. But guess what? We still had goals. We still had things that we had to achieve. We were still setting out to achieve specific measurements and, and monuments in our district. So it forced us to do what even I wanted to do anyways, which is how do we make adjustments? How do we make changes? So don't, don't let it be just a once a year check-in. Make sure that you are looking at that on a regular basis. Does your board items line up with that? So like we, we establish and we put in that every one of our board items have to be tied to um, the areas of our strategic plan. We do, you know, we do our, a review um, several times a year, even with our school board of this is where we are, um, but it has to, you have to live that. And I still think at times we don't do a good job of that as well, right? Because the day-to-day -day operations, you just blink and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we're already in January. It's just the nature of, of the school that, uh, work that we do, but keeping your eye on, on what your objectives are. So making sure that you set those objectives, you set a specific plan in order to achieve them. Um, but then what happens when you don't achieve them, when you don't hit that, what are you going to do differently and how are you going to make sure that you, um, that you continue to adjust? I used to set, Hey, we're going to hit here. Everyone's going to be at this level. So student achievement at this level, at this grade level in that, in that regard. And I still think that there's a piece to that. But for me also, it became about growth and me making sure that how are our students improving? Hey, I'm not going to get every single student to be at the same level at the same time. But if I can show that students are learning, that's the whole point every single day that they're growing. 
and our staff the same way. Like, are we improving every single day and how do we show that and continue to monitor that? So I think about a couple of things. One, if you're a superintendent listening, you're thinking about your strategic plan, you think about your board, whether in some states there's a five-person board, others are a seven-person board. In some cities, the mayor chooses members of your board, the governor chooses members of your board. So it looks different all over the nation. However, one thing we all know is that you have to set high goals because your board members will say, well, we don't want to have low achievement. And so you set those goals and, and you want to achieve them absolutely. They can't all be sort of these moonshots. And so I think you've really raised an important piece, which is that your board also wants to see that you're making progress. And so setting those growth goals is important for your board and then also for your principals and your teachers who it can be incredibly and endlessly dismaying if you've set goals that potentially are really difficult to meet. But if you can see growth each year, you can feel that success, success breeding success kind of feeling. Um, The other thing I thought about was, the importance of establishing as part of your board meetings, the fact that your strategic plan is ever present. So board items is what you said, that regular review, those mid course corrections when appropriate, all those are important as you consider the advice for those who are working on their strategic plan. So thank you. Kenny, one of the questions I ask every guest who comes on the podcast is, is what does an imperfect leader mean to you? So how does that term resonate with you? Well, I think that was one of maybe the first things that, um, besides the fact that you were, you were doing this podcast, but I think that's one of the first things that resonated in particular because, um, I have said several times and I even use this in, in, uh, my speech to my entire staff this year is, you know, we are all imperfect people leading imperfect people. So don't, don't ever think that I am. I don't ever consider myself to be the end all be all that I know everything and that I don't make mistakes. I'm going to own the mistakes that I make and I'm going to make sure that you all understand that, Hey, this was, this was a mistake. We're going to learn from it. I apologize for it and we're going to move on, but here's what we're going to do about it. But we're leading imperfect people. And so we need to make sure that we're always understanding that. The other side to that, that that really struck me when I was thinking about this podcast was Another, you know, part of the definition of imperfect is incomplete. And so I always think as educators, we, we should all be incomplete, right? We're not ever going to be where we want to be because we don't have the same set of circumstances every single day. So the kids don't come in the same every day. The staff doesn't come in the same every day. The situation, the weather, I mean, not everything is the exact same every single day. If it was, man, it would be, you're right, it would be pretty easy. And we would have it down to a science every single day. Those things all change every single day. So we are all incomplete and we're always learning and we're always trying to improve. We're always trying to be better. An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action is supported by ILAA, a firm dedicated to supporting aspiring new and established leaders. For more information, please find them at human-centeredleaders.com. We're back for segment two of an imperfect leader called Imperfect Leadership in After Action. My guest is Dr. Kenny Rodriguez, the superintendent of the Grandview C4 School District. In this segment, we ask our guests to deconstruct a decision that they had to make, and then we discuss it. So, Kenny, what happened? Well, I mean, obviously, forefront in everybody's mind, and every time I was thinking about this question, certainly a lot of different scenarios kind of come up because you make a lot of decisions throughout um, careers and and such, but... um, most recently for me, I mean, this is year seven as being a superintendent. And I don't know that anybody will ever go anything through anything like what we've done for the last three years. So when I was really thinking about this question, it was really about, you know, kind of pandemic learning and then that post pandemic learning, because that's kind of still where we are today, you know, being, uh, being in kind of year three of what that looked like. If you go back to 2020 being the first piece and I have gone back through um, this so many times in my head of things that I wish I did better or things that we could have done better and everything like that. But I think one of the other important things with any decision is you also look at what went really well. Like, What did you do well? What are you proud of? I, I still would stick um, what we've done up with anything else, anybody else in the country, because I think we did it the right way with students being at the forefront. So every decision that we made through this time was really focused on what was going to be best for student learning. Example number one that I would give, let's go past the shutdown because there was nothing anybody could do. We all just kind of went home and we were still learning and we did virtual and all that kind of stuff. 
But starting in the 2020 school year, we knew that we just couldn't do that. Like that was a that was an immediate reaction. We didn't have a choice, but now we've had all summer, right? We've had all these wonderful months to be able to figure out everything um, brand new. And so uh, decision number one was, we are we going to allow our staff to work remotely again? Um, because we knew we, we were not going to start with kids uh, being in person. Or are we going to uh, uh, talk to our staff and have them come in person? And what we believed is, I believe that for student learning, it was going to be better for our staff to be in our buildings. Um, they could still be, you know, uh, in their own room. They were still going to be safe because they could be away from everybody else. Um, they didn't have to interact. They could still keep masks on, but they could be in their room around and not without distractions, which we all knew were going to be distractions at home. I mean, we all have distractions. And so for student learning, it was going to be the most effective for our staff to be in the buildings. And that was a big deal. I mean, our staff were not happy about it. Kids aren't going to be here. Why do we have to be here? We should be able to be remote. And so we had to have a lot of dialogues and a lot of conversations. And uh, I think looking back on it, our staff would be honest and say, I understand that decision. Um, we had to put some childcare things in place because many of their schools were not in session. So it's like, what am I supposed to do with my kids? So we tried to partner with community and we had childcare uh, as a possibility for, for our staff before and after their contract time. And so we tried to make sure that we had everything, uh, at least trying to help the best we possibly could. Then the decision to when we bring students back at that time, obviously the younger um, were more protected. And so we brought our younger students back as quickly as possible with a focus on K2. It's like, this is their first experience and, and everything with learning. Like we've got to get our youngest students in as quickly as possible. So doing that and how we, you know, kind of phased an in, in approach to where it took us all the way until um, about April to have all of our students um, back in session, you know, uh, every, every single day. And so that took a long period of time. But again, every single decision that we made of when to bring them back was all focused on their education and what was going to be in the best interest of them. I think what went wrong is when we're so focused on certain things, you can't focus on everything, right? So what did you lose in the process? And I think we lost a lot of things, a lot of things that we were doing pre-pandemic. Um, like we had, we had started to uh, institute real world learning. We were doing um, a lot of components with Project Lead the Way at our elementary sites. And we were recognized for a lot of those efforts and things. And then you just kind of, everything shuts down. And so you just stop paying attention to a lot of things. And so no matter what you do, you lose sight of some of the other components of, of what's going on. Then coming out and how are our staff members dealing with the um, pandemic themselves and how are, are the way they are interacting, impacting our student learning? How do we change the way that our kids are engaged and our staff are engaged to make sure that we can still achieve where we are. Because again, go back to five-year strategic plan, right? Implemented in 2019. We still have to, to reach certain benchmarks because our students deserve that. So we can't change the goal and, and lower the standards, but we have to do it differently. So the standards don't change, but how do we do it differently and how do we interact differently? So I think a lot of people who are driving, if you're not a superintendent, you're going, oh my God, it's dizzying to think about <laughs> everything that a superintendent was dealing with in 2020, 2021 school year. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but you remember the movie E.T., right? Oh, yeah. So, okay. So Atari Systems had decided they needed to have a game to go with E.T. to, to, to sell the movie. And they gave the programmers three months to program a game for E.T. And when it debuted, it was an epic failure because they didn't have enough time. It just was not enough time to put all that coding in to create an engaging and interesting game. So in fact, most of the screens are just E.T. is just stuck in a hole. And like, can you get E.T. out? I mean, that's it. And I think about that from time to time because of, like you said, through an appreciative lens, which I so appreciate, and it's amazing what our teachers, coordinators, principals, what they accomplished in order to get kids back into school to engage kids, whether it was virtual or in person throughout the pandemic. So I so appreciate how you have lifted them up and hold them up high because what they did was incredible. And yet they did it. They only had three months to do it. 
you know, it's important now looking back to say, okay, so what got overlooked? And so I, I'm, I wrote down a few things as you were talking because you got basic needs met, right? Food, technology, trying to get kids into the building, taking this approach that, that got them back fully uh, in April. You also had to pause on a number of things. So real world learning for kids, project lead the way. These are areas that Grandview was held in high regard and you were getting recognized in this high distinction. And yet we were all forced to really work on those basic needs. You had uh, discipline now when kids are coming back. I remember hearing when I was working with children as a principal saying, my gosh, this kid, it's like, it's taken forever to really have these replacement behaviors to have better outcomes. And it was a behavior specialist who said, it's one month for every year old that this child is. So if this child is seven, you're not going to see the kind of results you hope to see until seven months from now. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh. So now we've got so many children who have been home and kids not having that face-to-face, -face, being able to share with each other, how to disagree with each other, how to engage and react. And so I, I it's unbelievable what superintendents have had to deal with and have had to lead through. And so as you were talking through, you've really talked through a number of things about what got overlooked. I'm wondering, is there anything you want to add in terms of what got overlooked? I think some of the things that got overlooked were because we were so hyper-focused on those pieces that you kind of forget, but also because you've not been through it, you kind of needed to go through it in order to be able to learn what you missed and the other component that I just think in terms of I switch gears on you and, and kind of things that I've learned is I don't think for most people that they probably would agree with this, but I know for me in particular, I don't know that COVID caused any new challenges. I think they highlighted a lot of the things that we already had gaps in our district about that maybe we could overlook or they still kept going because this is a big machine and just a big system that we can, it can be okay as a gap. When you have, so, so big example nationally, obviously is social emotional. So if you didn't have any social emotional supports prior to the pandemic, you were panicking going through this and trying as best as you can to put anything together. You needed it beforehand too, but there, it may not have come, come as much of a highlight to it. Um, but then all of a sudden it's hyper-focused. Um, That's I'm interesting. Sure. I wonder just for a second, because you, you talk about what it has done is, is it has exposed the real challenges that already existed, these sort of pre-existing pieces. And so I can remember having a conversation with middle school advisory. So teachers who were in middle schools who would meet with me once a month. And there was a real reticence about giving up time for advisory. Nobody would question whether or not advisory is an important component to the development for children post-pandemic or at this stage of the pandemic. I couldn't have convinced them back then. Now it's not even an argument. Yeah, the, the relationship piece, right? Like we know relationship. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I build relationships with my kids. No, you need to understand the level of relationships that our students need. And what's funny is our staff, I think, need the same thing. What frustrated you? I think um, one of my main frustrations were you knew sometimes what needed to happen and what you wanted to do, but you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. You, you weren't going to be able to achieve that for whatever reason, um, any number of different reasons, whether it's because the health department said so, or you just, you didn't have the resources or whatever the case may be. It was, you know, shutting down, first of all, you know, felt like giving up. Like, I know it was the right thing to do and the safety and all that kind of stuff, but it seemed counterproductive for all of us. Like, these are kids that are counting on us. So you talk about meeting their needs. So it's like, okay, well, clearly we still need to give out food and clearly we still need to do this, this, and this. It never even crossed our minds to just stop doing all that stuff. It was, this is what we have to do. But to not be able to have kids in our buildings and to have safe places for kids to go um, and know that that's what many of them rely on every single day, it just hurt. It hurt every single day to not be able to have them in our buildings, um, helping them through all the challenges. You felt powerless. Absolutely. I think, so that's why I think we focus on what we can focus. Cause like, okay, well, this is what I can do. This is all I can do. So I'm going to at least do that. 
And then you hopefully continue to expand that. But I think that was one of my biggest frustrations. And then well, I would that, also imagine people knew you as their assistant soup. They knew you now as their soup. They've always trusted in you. You felt powerless. You wanted to be able to be there and and solve problems, yet it was a complex problem. There was no real solution. There was no good solution. Correct. There was no right solution. It was just what's going to be in the best interest of what we can do based on the scenario in our district and our situation. And that's all we could do. And so that's what I communicated. I just communicated with parents and everybody. And it's like, hey, this is where we are. This is what I know. I'm going to tell you exactly what I know. I'm, I'm a pretty transparent guy. So it's, I'm not a good actor. So I'm not going to lie. I'm just going to say, look, I've got zero control over this, or this is where we are. This is what I know that we can do, that I can, I can make sure that our students and staff and, staff and everybody are as safe as possible. Um, but I think that was a frustration. So in 2019, our theme for the year was, we know the way. So of course, then in 2020, in the spring of 2020, it was like, uh, do we know the way? <laughs> now, in January of 2020, the IT department would say to me, what is your theme for next year? Because they would start working on the image for all the computers. And I said, well, it's going to be 2020. So like 2020 vision. So we're going to say the vision is clear. And then of course, <laughs> nobody came back to me in the spring to say, like, do you still want that on the image? So every computer said, the vision is clear, you know, as <laughs> we come back virtually and we're struggling to get kids back into school. And we also didn't fully get back until after spring break in April. And every time I'd walk into any room or I'd see a computer, I'd be like, please just put down your computer because I cannot look at this. The vision is clear. That is so, amazing. <laughs> what could you have done differently? Uh, I would have brought probably students back quicker. I would have, um, I would have gone ahead and, and pushed that uh, narrative just a little bit more. I would have pushed back maybe a little bit more on some of our officials and health and health folks. But at the same time, I think about our staff and I'm not sure that maybe our staff would have been able to do that either. And so um, I think as we get into 2020 and 2021, I would have gone back more to our strategic plan and even looked at where are the gaps? What else are we seeing? And how do we put those things in place when we do come back? So I was thinking, you know, system leaders, what they do best is that they consider what their plans are and what the unintended consequences could be. And so you had this strategic plan, all the pandemic hits. And so you start to begin thinking what might be the unintended consequences. Now that's a real luxury if you're not in the middle of a storm. In the end, what was something that was good that came out of this? I think we have a stronger school district right now because of it. Our community relations are stronger. Our relationships with our parents are stronger. I think we have a more open dialogue with our students, um, with our faculty. I think they provide more feedback now than before. I think we've engaged them on a different level and see those changes and challenges. I was in front of the community in a different way. Like I was doing Facebook Lives and I was doing all kinds of things with our staff and with our community and with parents um, that I had not done before. I mean, I'd always made myself available and been out in the community, but um, they, were, they were going back and forth and we were having a different dialogue. And I think we built a different level of trust because we put ourselves out there saying, hey, we're gonna be there for your family and for your kids and for whatever you need. You call us, you tell us, we're gonna make sure that we, that we do what we can. My guest again was Dr. Kenny Rodriguez. And, you know, I started this conversation lamenting how we never got to know each other better when we were both serving as superintendents. And really, um, I'm just so grateful for the time that you've given me today. You clearly are somebody who is um, doing some exceptional things, deeply reflective, incredibly vulnerable. And uh, I'm grateful for your time. Thanks so much, Kenny. Appreciate you as well. And uh, always look forward to talking to you again, sir. Music for an Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created the Daruma Doll Butterfly Artwork. Imperfect leadership is not a scarlet letter. It is a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader, an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. And I'm proud to be an imperfect leader, so I hope you'll join me next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action. <laughs>